Good morning, one and all. <clears throat> Praise the Lord for um, bringing us as a family, extended family, back safely from Vietnam um, just last night. Um, it is an honour and a pleasure um, to serve the Lord in delivering, I think, a Christmas message this morning to all of you. Right. Um, but let, let us, before we commit to God's message, uh, let us start with a word of prayer. Let us bow our heads. Father, thank you for bringing us into your house today and appointing me to share your message to your people. Let not my word and not my voice be heard, but your voice be heard. Give us your wisdom. Free our minds from the various distractions that has followed us during the week and allow our hearts to be open to receive your message today. In Jesus' most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. I think some of you probably have seen some of these visuals before. Um, recently, the Straits Times did a full pictorial and editorial feature of what it means to look like Christmas. Um, and I think this was probably a very important and uh, attractive editorial angle that Straits Time wanted to write because this is the first Christmas after a two-year hiatus of COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and in this article and editorial, the look of Christmas was equated to be about twinkling lights, magical pseudo fake snowfalls, elaborate Christmas decorations, Christmas trees, of course, big, huge presents, and other eulatite sites. There was then subsequently another article that asked, why are we drawn to all these hustles and bustles of this Christmas season? Is it the joy of spending money? Or is it the joy of just, en or is it just enjoying the heartwarming, cozy atmosphere? Because you know, for us in Singapore especially, um, it's a rainy season, it's a time where the temperature falls to probably below 25 degrees at times. And then you have, you know, this hot, very cozy and warm atmosphere where you dine and feast over turkeys and roasted ham. So this is indeed how Christmas is largely celebrated and viewed today with a very commercial approach and largely very optical, very superficial. A Japanese television reporter once was walking the streets of Ginza, you know, the famous Orchard Road of Tokyo, during the Christmas festive season. And much as it is here in Singapore and elsewhere in the world, um, Christmas shopping is a big commercial success in Japan. The reporters stopped people um, along and, and mall shoppers on the streets of Ginza asking, what is the meaning of Christmas? What do you know about Christmas? One lady responded, it's a time of giving presents. Another one said, it's a time for me to enjoy the year-end sales. Another one says, laughingly, and she admitted, I'm not really sure. Is that the day that Jesus died? Now, if you take it at that perspective, I must say that there is some truth in the answer reflecting how the world looks at Christmas. The purpose of our living today, it's all about material needs. It's all about a me first self-serving intent. But I do hope that all of us seated in this sanctuary know that Jesus is actually, uh, that Christmas is actually the day when our Savior, Christ Jesus, was born. Just following on and staying close to my news articles, just this week, Straits Times wrote another article again, and this was about thinking differently about gifting. And upon reading this in Da Nang, I thought, hey, maybe I'll change the angle of my opening today. I thought it was so apt and relevant for God to use this article and to allow me to start today's message to us, looking at Christmas gifts differently. Because I'm sure a lot of us, especially the younger ones in the sanctuary, would be receiving a lot of Christmas gifts. 
So how do we look at Christmas gifts differently? Not at the physical gift from the optics and the material needs that I mentioned today, but how should we look at it differently? And this starts with what was read in the scripture today about the promise that God made to David as written in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It answers the, that Japanese reporter's question on what is the meaning of Christmas. Unless we understand King David's response to God's promise to him and why it was fulfilled by Jesus, the son of David, the son of God, we will not understand the true meaning of Christmas. You will not be able to appreciate and believe and accept God's Christmas gift to us. But before I get into sharing more about this gift, this promise, let us examine the scripture text again to read and unpack what led to God promising David and what was David's response. As was read in verse 1 and 2, David was very conscious of God's presence in his, in his life. After David had become well settled in Jerusalem and was enjoying a period of peace, rest from his enemies, his thoughts turned to the idea of building a more permanent structure in which Lord would, could reside among his people. So here, visually, you can see the tent where God resided, the ark of the Lord resided, and then a comparison and David's concern about his own house compared to that of God. Now, a point here is that David's idea and comparison proves once again the true nature of David's faith, where he hungers to serve God even during good times, during peaceful times, during happy times. And this comes to mind something that just happened in Da Nang as well. Um, as all of you have probably been following Andrew or Priscilla's Instagram or um, social media, you noticed that we enjoyed a very accelerating, actually Alistair, Alistair enjoyed a very accelerating jeep ride to the countryside of um, Hoi An in Vietnam. And at the end of that tour, um, we of course had a dinner that was prearranged by the tour guide. And um, Mrs. Fee uh, led us to give thanks uh, before dinner. And after the tour at the end at night, um, the tour guide, Tan, he actually dropped me a message and he said, hey, thanks for everything. Could you share some pictures? Um, but more importantly, I think he shared a message to me saying that I really learned something from you all today. I learned about how you all had this practice of giving thanks before dinner. Um, it's so meaningful and wonderful for me. And I was kind of sharing with him that actually is not a practice. It is our belief that we must thank God for all that we are blessed with during good times and bad times. And I was just sharing with him that, you know, it's a holiday. Um, we're enjoying ourselves. The weather has been great. Uh, unfortunately, I think Ken experienced the big rainfall the week before. We were uh, very blessed by God. Uh, we did not experience much rain um, at all. Um, during a period of time. So I was, we were using and I was using this opportunity to share with him that even during a holiday when you know, we are all enjoying ourselves, um, we're happy, um, we must be intentional in actually serving God. It's not, a, it's not a practice that we feel good about. It's because it's our desire and hunger to actually serve God and to give thanks for all the blessings that we've received. So Dearly beloved, it is important to emulate the behavior of David, to seek to serve God, not only during times when we need God, when it's challenging and it's hard for us, but also times when we subconsciously don't think we need Him because we are preoccupied with the happiness, the peacefulness in our lives. And then in verse 3, um, King David shares his thoughts to Nathan, Prophet Nathan. 
Nathan then agrees and tells him to go ahead, do what your heart desires because the Lord is with you. That's it, Nathan perhaps assumed it was what God might want because it sounded logical, it was righteous, God-centered. But that same night, when Nathan seeked God's will on King David's plan, on the contrary, God validated David's plan with a different perspective. Sometimes, don't we also behave like Nathan, especially when it sounds right? It feels righteous. It feels like we are serving and honouring God. How often do we seek God's validation, evaluation, confirmation of our intended action and plan to serve Him? I know I'm guilty of that sometimes, especially in the corporate world where you know, you've done something before, you know, it's tried and tested, you know, it sounds right to you, it sounds like it's going to have an expected result. But how often do we actually commit it to the Lord in prayer before we actually act on it? Something for us to actually reflect about. And then as we move on into verse 4 and 7 to reveal God's true validation of David's concern about God's house, through Nathan, God first reminds David that, hey, I do not actually need a house during the Exodus. Remember that. And this reaches back to the history of God's early relationship with Israel. When the tribes came out of Egypt, the ark was housed in a tent and moved the, when the people moved. The virtue of the tent sanctuary was its mobility. They went where it went. This wilderness tradition was significant for God didn't want them to lose the earthly pilgrimage aspect of their fellowship of God. As they had not settled in all the land that God has promised and wants them to be in. Now a key clarification point here is that it does not mean that God does not want his house to be built in time to come. Rather, God forbids David to build it. God is telling David, you are not the one that I want you to build the house. Because, as is written in the first Corinthians chapter 22, verse 8, but the word of the Lord came to me saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. And further in Deuteron Deuteronomy 12, chapter, 10, uh, chapter 12, verse 10 to 11, God says, He will choose a place after giving the Israelites the land that they will inherit, giving them rest from their enemies, a place for them to worship Him. So God intends for His house, and God wants and instructs His house to be built, but not by David. So God is redirecting David's plan in his validation. He does not want David to build it, but he wants David to plan, prepare, receive the plans by God to make many of the preparations. And this will be reflected in 1 Corinthians chapter 22, uh, chapter 22 to 29, choosing the site, gathering the materials, finding skilled craftsmen, and clearing the way with other officials to make the location of his house ready. Now this validation of David's concerns, besides an element of correction, also comprises of an element of reassurance. It continues with God pointing out in verse 8 and 9 that the lack of a permanent place has not hindered God from being with David all the time. But he was moved from falling sheep to being appointed as the shepherd and ruler of his people by God, blessing Israel with the many triumphs over his enemies all this time. In verse 10, God then reassures and reaffirms to David, the covenant or the promise 
that he had made with Abraham and Moses much earlier. And in, um, in Genesis chapter 12, it reads, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. So this covenant that God had made with Abraham and Moses seeks to reassure David that he will make Israel a great nation again. He will make Israel a great nation, sorry. Bless his descendants, bless all those who bless the Israelites and destroy all those who seek to harm the Israelites. So church, validation from God not only comprises of a correction, but it also comprises of an element of reassurance and comfort that God's will and plan for us is to bless us with our interests at heart. So let me now res reflect upon God's response to David's initial plan on building a temple. Let me tell you a story about a church that was once vandalized. It was early on a Sunday morning, just like all of us, the members of a congreg congregation of a particular church entered into the sanctuary and they were shocked to see their pastor standing in the middle of a complete mess. So apparently vandals have came the night before. They shattered the stained glass windows, overturned the pews. Up in front of the sanctuary above the altar, they spray painted three words in bright red. God is nowhere. The members of the congregation clearly were very anxious, shaken, shocked. The pastor urged them to stay and worship as they had planned. He told them to look at those three words above the altar again. Not as God is nowhere. For some, it might have seemed that that was exactly the case in the morning because some were questioning where was God when these vandals were desecrating his house of worship. But the pastor, sorry, the pastor says, told the members, look at the sentence above the altar in a different way, beyond the optics, very much like how the modern world looks at Christmas, beyond the optics of how it's celebrated. He told them to divide the last word of nowhere of that sentence between the W and the H. And what do you see? God is now here. The sentence changes and we are reminded of God's promise to us. When the members now look at that spray-painted sentence again with the W and the H split, it no longer says God is nowhere. It says God is now here. And as they or the congregation members become less anxious, the members also start to recall God's promise, God's promise to David. And this is exactly what happens in the next part of today's message from verse 11 to 16. God says he's going to build a house for David in verse 11. But wait a minute. David, doesn't David already has a house, as was read in verse 1 and 2, a house of cedar, wood? So what is God referring to here? God's purpose was larger than David could have imagined. As we all know, our ways or God's ways are higher than our, our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So David simply wanted to build a physical temple for the ark of the Lord. And you'll probably hear in the next preacher series when we speak about Solomon, you'll find out that Solomon did wind up building the temple, but it would eventually be destroyed and become a ruin. But God had a bigger purpose, something larger, his plan involved something much more lasting than an optical stone structure. God goes on to say from verse 13 to 15 that the Messiah would come 
from the lineage of David, and that this descendant would reign over a kingdom forever. It will be established and it will endure forever. And this promise will be made by God as a father to a son. It will be unconditional, just like the covenant and the promise to Abraham. Meaning that it is made on God's faithfulness, not on our obedience, not on our work. It is made on God's faithfulness, love and mercy. This promise is known as the Davidic covenant. And it is summarized by four key words as we reference verse 16. House, promising a dynasty, a church in the lineage of David. Kingdom, referring to a people who were governed by a messianic, who will be governed by the, a messianic king. A throne, emphasizing the authority of the messianic king's rule. And forever emphasizing the eternal and unconditional nature of this promise to David and Israel. So church, on Christmas, Jesus' birth marks the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant together with his death and resurrection. In Luke chapter 1, verse 31 to 33. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. These were the words that the angels spoke to Mary about her being appointed and chosen to bear the Son of God. To see that Jesus is of the lineage of David that will build God's house, this church will endure forever. And as mentioned earlier, a quick read of the kings who came after David showed that they failed miserably. There is no king from David's family on the throne just 400 years after God's promise. There's only one way that this promise, this Davidic covenant can be fulfilled, and it's through Jesus. A dynasty that is a church that is not of physical boundaries or means. The fullness of Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus was not simply another king in a perpetual line of covenant kings. Jesus was the destination. Jesus was where the promise was headed. There are no kings after Jesus because death cannot end the reign of Jesus Christ, the king who conquered death. And in his reign, his rule extended beyond any long forgotten physical borders. As Christians, we no longer need an ark or a temple to worship the Lord because the the Lord is accessible in every place. So dearly beloved, we are a church today. We have a church today because God used David's family to bring Jesus Christ, the Savior, into the world on Christmas. Christmas is where we celebrate the coming of Jesus, the descendant of David, as the Savior of the world. In Acts chapter 13, verse 33 to 32 to 34, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us as their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my God, my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. So 
So church, now that we have received God's wisdom into 2 Samuel chapter 7 from verse 1 to 17, in his unconditional promise to David in bringing us Jesus Christ, the Saviour into our world to be our Christmas gift, how should we respond and apply this new wisdom or this wisdom that we have gained? Well, the way that David responded to this great promise in the rest of 2 Samuel chapter 7 is a good example for us today to examine it. Upon realizing the significance of Nathan's word to him, as reflected in verse 17, King David departs from Nathan and sits before the Lord. He is so overwhelmed by all that he has heard from God through Nathan, the avalanche of promises. He goes and sits before the very presence of the Lord. Here, he humbles and submits himself as reflected from verse 4, 19 to 29. Before the Lord, he prayed and worshipped. And at least 10 times in those verses, he keeps calling himself, submitting himself as the servant of God. Then from verse 18 and to 23, in different parts of the verses, David then addresses God as the Lord God, adoring him as a sovereign Lord and praising the promises of the covenant as a great thing, that it comes from a God like no other. And then in verse 27 to 29, David also asks that his house be built just as the Lord had promised. Thy kingdom come is the trust and emphasis of verse 27. Thy will be done is the trust and emphasis of verse 28. It was not enough for David to simply just hear the promises and believe them. He also took action and prayed to God to fulfill them. So church, this Christmas, like David, let us sit before God in humility, praise, and express our faith in God's will and plan for us to be part of this church of Jesus Christ. Here I'd like to kind of pause for a while and probably share something quite close and quite vulnerable in my, in, 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 in my situation. Um, some of you might not know, um, I'm actually jobless now, right? Um, so I'm actually in the midst of a career transition, I would say. Um, taking a career break, looking at what direction I want to actually um, continue on my career journey. So you know, ma many various factors clearly are um, in consideration. So after more than 20 years of climbing the corporate ladder and giving my all, um, because you know, Nate always says that um, I work very hard and I'm never at home, um, I've decided to take two to three months of a break um, to decide where I want to actually move on in my career. Um, the other thing as well, just to address it, uh, don't get the wrong idea, I'm not thinking of going to pastoral work just yet. <laughs> uh, it's more to take stock and uh, decide what to do next. Um, um, clearly, I've got three mouths uh, to feed as well. Um, and it is through this taking stock and deciding what to do next that I believe I've experienced God's... Um, Call, uh, will and plan to follow David's example as a member of his church, as a servant of God's kingdom. Um, it has been very an intense two years um, in this new Southeast Asia regional role that I've been doing, um, reporting into a management team, a leadership team, a boss, that, uh, and also probably sharing uh, a peer group who do not share the same values and work ethic as me. Um, as I think we all learned uh, during the leadership course uh, led by and uh, conducted by Elder Peter, I, I'm a firm believer of servant leadership and I think that was what uh, the leadership traits that um, 
our Lord Jesus Christ exemplified as well when he was on this earth. And I do believe that um, all of us, if we are, and myself included, if we are appointed as a leader, we are appointed by God as a leader not to manage people and not to instruct people or delegate jobs. Um, we've been appointed as a leader to serve others. Um, and the, these values and work ethics, unfortunately, was not as commonly shared um, with the leadership team that, um, or with the team that I work with. That said, um, the business results for the portfolio under uh, my jurisdiction was doing very well. It over-delivered and um, my direct reports and me, we were working very well as a team, uh, developing a very high performance culture, we call it, uh, amongst ourselves. But no matter how much we over-delivered, uh, it was never enough. Uh, the bosses were always asking us, uh, the leadership team that I was reporting to, was always asking for more, um, to deliver more. Um, and to make things more challenging, we were not given the resources as well as uh, the support needed to fuel that additional growth and the additional um, delivery of targets that we need to, because we are not a prioritised market. But that said, I, I was happy that despite the challenges um, with the leadership approach and mentality that I was bringing to the team, or my team, um, in contributing, developing and nurturing them, I could see that their response to me and my leadership style was also very encouraging. So throughout this time, I've been praying to God that should it be His will and His plan that I continue to stay on with this current company and that I would humbly sum submit myself and follow. Then in August, late August, early September, a decision was made to restructure the company, um, reducing, removing the team members under me. And that was when I realized that with the new team structure, I will not be enabled or resourced enough to continually put, de deliver and exemplify the servant leadership. I would not be able to effectively contribute to my team members because I believe, like I said, I'm appointed as a leader to support them. And if I'm in a position where I'm not able to support them and to get the best out of them, I believe God willing is ask, and, and God's plan is for me to probably pivot and make a different career decision. So I kept praying and asking God to allow me to have an avenue amidst this um, restructure with, if it is his will and plan to take a break to decide what to do next and praise God at the end actually in the middle of September with his provisions and blessings I was able to establish an amicable arrangement with the boss who clearly had a different um, perspective of how he wanted to lead the team and was very supportive and understanding of um, the arrangements that um, I was requesting for. So I, I believe my calling is in the marketplace to use what Christ has taught me to exemplify his teachings, to reflect the nature of Christ in providing a vulnerability that reflects a confidence to say what needs to be said when mistakes are made. Um, and that's why probably I don't like to play political games. Um, but more importantly, I think, is to serve others in order to bring change and value to colleagues, partners, uh, and peers. So today, by God's grace, I am exploring a couple of options. Um, I'm praying about the future of my career with respect to these options, um, especially with bills to pay and, like I said, three mouths to feed. But just as David has shown, um, I need to remember and be reminded to submit to God to answer my prayers in a far greater way and not in how I will look at things and not in how I will see them and not in how I will view my own house of cedar. So I will continue to seek God's kingdom to come and his will to be done in deciding the next steps of my career. So dear brothers and sisters in in Christ, in conclusion, 
The promise God made to David can also include you. Here's how you can be included in David's family. To be part of God's house that endures forever. We need to repent and believe in Jesus Christ, God's gift to you this Christmas. Believe that Jesus has come to fulfill the promise of David, a promise to David. Acknowledge that he is our Lord and Saviour. And upon receiving this gift, just like David, humbly submit. Give praise and express our faith in his kingdom to come and his will to be done. Of all the gifts you receive this Christmas, this is the gift that is different. This is the gift that is worth receiving because it is different. Let us bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your only Son, Jesus Christ, this Christmas, so that we may be allowed to enter into your kingdom and receive your blessings. Let us not get too distracted into the worldly celebrations of Christmas, the optical nature of Christmas that we are presented with, but rather allow us to follow Christ and receive the blessings of your kingdom that you had promised David, which will endure forever. In Jesus' most precious and holy name we pray. Amen.